Hello and welcome to another episode of Rapidly Aging Tech. Today we're finally talking about it, at least part one, of the Dell XPS 700 series, in this case the 720 um, H2C. I may have gotten some of those letters flipped around. This also happens to be the red version. So this was Dell's super high-end uh, gaming platform machine um, back during the waning days of Netburst and the beginnings of the Core 2 era. So we're going to take a look around the machine. We're going to add some upgrades to it. And we might start the op uh, OS install, but we'll end up doing the rest of it, uh, maybe showing some games or whatnot, in a second video because it's going to take some time. But let's take a look around the machine. So one simple thing I want to point out before we move on to actually looking at the machine is you notice some goofy stuff on the corner here. Now this side panel, this is actually a new side panel that happens to have a ding that matches up. But this case went through something fairly violent and I'll show you the original side cover that this thing came with. Over here we have the original side panel and at first glance I mean you see the goofy locking mechanism which I'll explain how it works. Um, nothing looks too out of place except for it looks a bit dinged up here. As you can see, this has been gouged up and actually juts out that way, um, as if someone put their fingers around the side panel and pulled off. And if you look, if you look here, you'll see that there's some broken plastic there and some broken plastic there. And those spots, there were these, these plastic hooks that lock into places on the case. And this rear handle pulls the whole system out. So this is how the side panel comes off. In a similar mechanism, though not as, say, smooth and clean as the Power Mac G5, but it is a locking spring system. So I replaced this panel with a new one. Plus its XPS logo was getting a bit, it's a bit worn down. Bits of it are breaking off and falling to the side. So it now has a brand new one. Though it is technically black, I don't think it makes too much of a difference. So let's take a good look at the front here. We have what are covered over drive bays. If we pull them out, you'll see that they flip down if CD drives pop out. So we do have two of them populated. Um, nothing much to look at. They're black. They're optical drives. And these other ones have been left empty with their metal slot covers left in to keep noise down. This section here has room for two floppy drives or any other 2.5 inch drives. Um, originally these things had an option for a C, uh, uh, an SD card reader and whatnot and I got a version however it doesn't like the, the um, retaining mechanism of these drive bays. They're the usual Dell um, screw, you put in long screws and they go in on tracks and are held in. Well, this one is for a slightly different Dell system using the same principle, so I'm using dual floppy drives. One is connected to the floppy drive controller, which I believe is a single floppy controller. It can't control two, car two uh, drives, and the other one's through the USB adapter. If you're interested in that, you can see my other video. And down here we have the power button and the logo. And this is all uh, a vent here. Of course we have our traditional stickers. So the Core 2 Duo. And you'll notice something interesting here. Most people think of the Core 2 era as thoroughly in Vista's wheelhouse. But there was this, there was a time here um, and I think went through most of the Vista era, where people didn't like Vista. Didn't like it a lot. And I kind of sympathized with them. It was pretty buggy on release. Um, used more resources. And it had some compatibility issues. 
of course, every newer version of Windows 10 is, I think, have a little bit of that, especially now. Anywho, it says it's designed for XP, but Windows Vista compatible. This thing, in fact, did ship with XP. Let me show you the evidence of that right now. Top of the case, it's been torn apart for some reason, but this shipped with Windows XP Professional. That's right. This machine, which can have up to 8 gigs of RAM, shipped with XP, with a Core 2 Duo processor. And I'll tell you what's in it right now. It's a Q6600. Um, yes. <laughs> Long live XP. Long live the king. Looking at the side, there's nothing much here other than it's shiny aluminum. And there's, the, of course, the XPS logo, which we took a look at. You'll notice that there are some uh, feet. There's feet on each side. That little silver ones kind of sloped back. In my mind, that combined with the sloping intake um, look of the front, it gives it a very, um, I don't want to say aerodynamic, but uh, it reminds me of aircraft, some sort of um, jet engine thing, almost as if those are the tiny wings and this is the big intake for some, some, some a jet motor. Uh, it's quite impressive. And it's, it's a very different look from the um, Power Mac G5. But it shares some elements, which is why I'm dubbing this machine Dell's anti-Power Mac G5. Um, slight, just the time frame was very close, slightly off from each other, but they share a lot of things. One, one of which being this heavy-duty thick aluminum case. Let's take a look around the back now. So we're on the back now looking at the power supply and I mean this part doesn't look too out of the ordinary other than it just the fan is on the inside pushing out I suppose on the back pulling. It has an interesting power plug. That's not something you'd see too commonly. Let me grab the cable. What a monster cable this is. The power supply is 1000 watt and this connector, if you remember right, is more or less the same as the Power Mac G5. It's that um, strange server style connector for um, high end systems. Dell used it too. So that's another similarity. Both the wattage, it's the same wattage as the Power Mac G5, and that it uses. Uh, a, a non-standard, or at least a non-consumer standard connector. Going down the I.O. shield, remember this is BTX form factor, so this is visually the wrong side of the case. Um, the, you'd think, on a normal ATX system, the I.O. shield would be on this side. We have uh, all of our audio connections, including a optical audio out. Genuine PS2 ports, which is a nice thing to see. Um, especially a lot of the Dell systems of this era have gone away with PS2 and was, were USB only. But I think the um, low latency and just, just general goodness of PS2, especially for keyboards, uh, made them keep it for this more gaming centric design. We have six USB ports. Um, there's definitely room for another two physically on the, on the uh, IO shield there. Six is, I think, decent enough. Um, it probably could use some more. We have our Gigabit Ethernet and FireWire 400. Remember, for a while, FireWire was starting to creep onto PCs a bit until it stopped. And we have, of course, a graphics card in here and some expansion slot bays. And you'll notice that this back portion here it's all, it's not faux mesh either. That's actual, there's actual airflow through all this. We have a fan, which I put in. I'll just admit that now. And yeah, we'll see why. And airflow out here. You can see that there's a part of a, a Dell locking system over the slots. This side of the case isn't too important other than to show that the XPS logo on this side has completely come off with just the glue remaining. This side panel, I'm sure there's a way to replace it, but it's more 
in, it, it's more involved because it seems to be pretty well stuck together. The bottom section is kind of interesting looking. On the front, what's making contact with the ground are essentially this is a bunch of plastic grooves. So these sit on the ground there. And I believe that when Dell designed this case, they found that maybe it was an afterthought, maybe it wasn't, but it's a little top heavy. Um, it tends to be, it'll be a little wobbly, especially in this configuration. So they put on these um, wing feet, which they move out together, just like that. Now, right now we're on the ground, so we can't go very far, but yeah, that's how they move out. And then they move back together. It's a pretty neat design. And uh, I think it's well executed. And this, uh, this is how you can unscrew to start removing this whole bottom section. Clearly, it's been scratched up a bit. So that's how that works. So you don't have to have them out, but uh, I'd recommend it. Right, so now we're going to open this guy up. And what you do is you'll take this handle, which in this case is black, but traditionally was red on a red case. And you'll do that to undo the latches, and then you're going to pull the side panel off. It's a bit awkward to do one-handed, especially um, when the case has been roughed around a bit. So we have a couple of guide poles, one there, one there, and all the latching nubbins. And those go into, there's a guide hole, there's a guide hole, and then you can see all the nubbin latches. And look at this forward one, you can see that's been bent out because someone tried to yank on the side of the case. So there's uh, some damage there, but overall this uh, door stays on nice and secure unlike the previous one. Now normally I take full responsibility for my magically perfect uh, cable management, but in this case I'm not going to because some of it predates me. I imagine Dell had this thing pretty well sorted out, but the previous owner I think monkeyed around a bit. So it's a bit messy in here. But try to try to remove the cables using the power of imagination because I'm going to draw some, some connections here. First at the top we just have the big 1000 watt power supply. It is, it's a very stout unit there with its intake fan on that side. A couple of optical drives, one's SATA, one's IDE, just fine and dandy. Um, room for more. Okay, then here we have the drive base. Now remember back and maybe review if you haven't seen my um, She Wants the D, the Pentium D uh, XPS 400 video and my Power Mac G5 video, the fastest Power Mac G5. And you'll s notice the different ways the drives were handled. The XPS just kind of had them in the bottom. However, this XPS has them up at the top and in between there's a fan. That is a fan pulling air across the upper ones and over the rear hard drives out the back. Just like in the thermal zone on the Power Mac G5. It's a nice little uh, similarity between the two machines. And a fan is probably a good idea, especially since uh, the upper hard drive is a Velociraptor. I got that as a replacement um, to add some speed as the, for the boot drive, and that's a 500 uh, gigabyte, uh, it's a Western Digital or Seagate or something. Nothing too fancy, but 7200 RPM. In this section you'll see there are a lot of little hooks and whatnot for cable management and you'll see some down there too. So that at one point in time when this came from the factory a lot of this stuff was probably locked into a very specific pattern but now it's uh, well it's been fiddled with. So the first thing to point out is that a lot of this bundle here is for the USB to floppy drive converter. This other cable here if you go back to my XPS video, I mentioned that the front panel audio on one of these Dell machines was uh, its own connector, kind of a proprietary thing. Well, um, this is what it looks like. It's a long white connector, just kind of wide, and a thick black cable. And that's connected currently 
to the onboard audio, which I'll have to find. I think it's somewhere. Yeah, there it is. All that cable down there. I expect that we're going to have a card uh, replacement to, to switch that out with. Down here, we have, well, something quite large and terrifying looking. This is the H2C uh, liquid cooling system. It says ceramic cooling system. Uh, I'm not sure if that's just because the, there's ceramic involved, but it is a pressurized liquid cool system. It also lights up when the machine is on, and I'll try to show that. This is what makes this machine particularly special. And much like the PowerMac G5, it is also liquid cooled. We're going to be taking that out. Yep, that's right, because I need to switch out of that CPU. Forgive the car noises, it's bloody hot today and I'm leaving the window open. So we're going to do some work on that. And we have a front fan here, just like on the XPS 400. And the expansion card slots. Now this particular, oh, excuse me, that cable out of the way. This particular graphics card, you know something special about it, it has two PCBs. This is an NVIDIA 7950X2. It is a dual GPU. Um, in this case, it's a dual card GPU, not just a dual graphics chip. Dual PCB with an interconnect uh, buried somewhere in there. I'll show you on the other card we're going to put in. Let's try other card. With th two of these, you can have um, four-way SLI. Yeah, that's fun. Um, these were an option available on the original 700, as far as I can tell. And while this 720 would be more appropriate with dual 8800s, um, I haven't ever quad SLI'd anything. In fact, I've never done SLI ever. It's just never happened. So this is going to be my first experience with it. One thing about some of these older cards is there are some drawbacks. Other than the usual Crossfire SLI drawbacks, um, in this case, you had to switch between um, four-way SLI, at least between four-way SLI, and multi-monitor mode. So if you wanted to use more than one monitor, you switched off on a lot of your computing power. Once you were going to go into a game, you'd then switch to a single monitor. Um, and you had to do that in the NVIDIA control panel. So that's interesting. And there are slots, of course. This is a very much kind of a workstation type feature much like the PowerMac G5. And down here, you may not be able to see them, but that is a large heat sink on the chipset, and there's another one over there for the other chipset. So the north and south bridge have a lot of cooling in this system. These systems were marketed as, you know, high-end gaming systems, overclockable, you know, officially overclockable from Dell, um, which is a, I mean, it's a very unusual f thing for, for Dell to offer. So they're very high end. The problem with the 700 and 710 was that while they were marketed as overclockable, there was uh, some feature, design feature in the motherboard made that not work well. I don't think you could actually overclock them. So they offered as a replacement the motherboard from the 720 to existing um, 700 and 710 owners so that they could overclock. And that's going to lead into a, 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 dis a choice I'm going to have to make. And of course I will share that with you. One thing I forgot to mention, I forgive the glare there, is not simply that this is you know, the, the floppy drive controller cable, but this uses non-standard um, power connectors, as far as I can tell. So we have w down here, which looks like a, what, a 20 pin? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So this looks like a 20 pin connector, which is unusual, but okay, whatever, Dell. You can do whatever you want. But then if we mosey the on over here, we have another connector, which also, which appears to be a 20 plus 4. So this thing, 
has a lot of power connectors. A lot of machines I think of this type would be the 20 plus 4 and then an additional 4 pin power connector. I'm not even sure if the additional 8 pin power connector was available yet. But this thing's using at least 44 pins for power. My current machine using uh, a SUS Crosshair 5 Formula Z running an FX9590 has a 20 plus 4 uh, plus an 8 pin and a 4 pin power connector. And that's a uh, and that's a super power hungry chip. So Dell must have really been preparing these things to guzzle as much power as they needed. So I mean good for them. I can't complain. You'll also notice along the edges here that there's a squishy um, foam for I imagine soundproofing and to make sure that the airflow only goes through the right spots. So that's a nice touch. Back here is that Corsair fan. I got that free when I built my main machine. It just came from Newegg because of what I ordered. It is a red um, fan. So it glows red. Um, red LED. Which is kind of the default color for the LEDs on this case. Which we, I told you that it glows here. I told you that that glows there. It's also mounted using Noctua rubber thingies. You pull them through and so they should reduce some vibration. But the case itself has LEDs that shine down. They glow over um, the, the drive slots and whatnot. It's a really nice effect, especially when it's dark. And I forgot to mention on the front, there's a Firewire 400. Great for your old first or second generation iPod. Two USB 2.0. Um, all the indicator lights. And your front panel audio. Which, because we have connected there, will actually work. So yeah, that's the inside. So let's see if we can get some upgrades going. All right, we're back, and now we need to get the graphics card out of the way, give us some more room. So first, we're going to undo the six-pin power connector. That's right, a dual GPU with only six-pin power. Isn't that fun? Then, see these blue tabs. We just uh, push down on a little notch and then push them out. And that will undo that. And then we need to figure out how to undo the little locking latch on the graphics card slot. I'm not sure why they have these. ISA didn't do it. PCI didn't do it. I think some AGP did it, but I don't think all AGP did it. It's a bit of a pain. So now we've gotten that loose. There we go. I'm trying to find a good shot of the interconnect. There we go. So here's the dual graphics. You got your dual coolers. And right down there, you'll see the interconnect between the two graphics cards. So that's fun. All right, next step we want to do is to undo this power connector, which I believe is for the um, CPU fan. Let's undo that. That was simple enough. Looks like it's keyed in there. There's another connector on this side, which um, goes to the power supply. I might just undo that. It connects up to here, up to this white connector, which is one of those funny Dell connectors you see on old Dell power supplies. But if it gives me enough slack, I might just leave it. Oh, I probably shouldn't do it. My arm's probably just covering everything. And there we go. So that's what it looks like. And it's keyed in good, so we're not going to lose anything. Getting all these extra cables out of the way. I think we got enough room for the nitty gritty parts. Let's pull this cable out. And do one last check 
for additional cables that we can see. Now you can see multiple screws and there are same same screws on the other side and I'm just going to undo these using my iFixit kit. And these are, uh, they feel kind of like captive screws. So I'm just going to assume they are. And I'll get back to you once I undo those. All right, I think I've gotten the screws undone. So let's see if I can pull this guy out without having too much issues. Hey, what are you bumping into, buddy? So I ended up finding what the issue was, of course, off camera. And that is that up near the front here, there's a little post and there was a little black screw. I undid that screw and of course it disappeared. But here is the XPS H2C cooling system, which was available for a little while and I think a few different flavors. If we flip it over, we have a I think it's a hybrid system. So it was probably the water pump there, a controller board back there, and whatnot. A system here, so some heat sinks here, and an actual traditional radiator on the front with a valve. A uh, little nub, and I don't think this is um, customer serviceable because it is a pressurized unit. And there's the cooling place for the CPU. It looks like this one was built in January 2007, which coincides with the original with the original case. It has multiple connections. So there's this one to the motherboard, probably just for control. This one to the power supply for power. And this one, I'm guessing for the um, light control through the BIOS. But it's a stout little unit. Um, very interesting design. All the cable connections, all the tubing seems to be in good shape. Nothing, I only saw like a little bit of gunk on, on one of the cables, but nothing that looked like a leak, just a little bit of goop there. So this should be just fine. While we're in here, you'll see the a better view of the chipsets. So we have a much, a very stout one over the north bridge and a decent one over the south bridge along with our four RAM slots which are buried under all these cables. So yeah there's a lot of uh, a lot of cooling in this system. So the next real question we have is what CPU do we put on? Now the sort of like simple answer would be a Core 2 Extreme QX6850. This was the high end offered on this machine for the super expensive ones it makes sense to put that in. That's a simple answer. Another option might be the Pentium Extreme Edition 965. Now why in the world would I suggest using a Netburst chip in this machine? Well as I mentioned earlier, owners of the 70710, which at least in part shipped with the Extreme 965 and 955 were offered and then the owners of those machines when they found that they couldn't overclock were given a new motherboard and I really doubt that Dell would send another CPU. So if that theory is true that they offered these motherboards as upgrades then I would expect this chip should work. Plus as of right now, um, I don't have a machine running a hyper-threaded dual-core netburst-based CPU. My XP machine originally did until I upgraded the BIOS, and then it couldn't anymore. And that's a rant for a different video. So there's a, a choice to be made here. Do I go netburst, or do I go uh, core 2? This might be Conroe. I don't remember which um, designation that'd be. Hmm. Just this one. Do it. Yes, you can. Just do it. Or the core two. I think there's some sort of law 
about not choosing net burst over over a core two, especially when it's a dual core versus a quad core. And when the last law was down and the devil turned round on you, where would you hide, Roper? The laws all being flat. Do it, do it, do it. Ah, screw it, I'm gonna do it. So as I'm cleaning this machine with my Arctic Clean kit, I'm not sure how well you can see it, but the paste is a very metallic paste, and it was still pretty supple. It's still in pretty good shape. That's interesting. But yes, very metallic. Um, I'll be using Arctic Silver 5 on this machine. All right, time for the CPU swap. Push down on the latch. Notice the BTX diamond orientation. LGA775. All right. That's the original chip here. Probably can't see the writing on it very well. It's a Q6600. This is a very popular CPU back in the day. Very popular indeed. And probably because it was a good quad core, um, it was a big step up from NetBurst. But, you know, this is called rapidly aging technology. So why in the world would I choose something like that? So sometimes on these OEM machines, they don't have all the features to make it easy to align the CPU. However, LGA775 has a couple notches on each side, one there, one there. So all you do is align with those because there's no other way for it to go in. That's in. We are good to go. So I'm going to clean that up a little bit, paste it, and we're going to put the heat sink back on. We'll put some Arctic Silver 5 right in the middle. That's probably plenty. Might as well just clean the nozzle off here. Do -do -do. So with that done, let's get the cooler back on. So this is going to be a bit awkward, but we're going to power through it. all sorts of cables that want to get in the way in this machine. Oh, I think we got it on. Oh. That looks good. Okay. Now it's just a matter of tightening screws. All right, with that done, we just need to put in a, since we're running out of time today, I know, right? Trying to make a short video, the nonsense. So I'm just gonna put a graphics card back in here so that we can at least get the machine booted on to see if it took the, um, the CPU upgrade. And I'll be using this card. This is the original one that came in it. It's a Radeon HD, oh, it's a, yes, 3650 PCI Express version. I think they made AGP versions of this. So we're putting this in. Um, I don't know why this would be in such a high-end machine. The owner must have switched it out or he compromised a lot. Um, we'll be putting it just in the graphics card slot just to make something work. This is actually the second GPU slot. The primary one is actually the second, this one to one down here. Remember, BTX is goofy. But the machine posts fine with the graphics card and only one slot there. So I'll put it in. We'll turn the machine on, see if we can actually get it to work. All right, let's see if she can still fire up. There's a lot of things that could have went wrong, including not getting something plugged in right. Oh, I don't think I have the power cable plugged in the back. <laughs> All right, when I plugged in the power, it is quick power on test and shut off like most Dell units do. So let's give her a go. Oh, look at those lights. She's spinning up. And we have BIOS. And here we are. 
Now you notice it sounds a bit loud today. It is hot and the machine also probably hasn't been set too much. Ooh, it recognizes it. Hyper-thread incompatible, yes. 64-bit technology, yes. Memory info, 800 megahertz, 8 gigabytes DDR2. It notices that there's a video card. Ooh, that's not good. I might have to update the C change the CMOS battery. Uh, boot sequence. So it's reset all the lights. So right now, so right now, I've selected it to the internal H2C coolers LED. Now watch, and in the BIOS, I'm so I'm in the color selector, and I can change the colors as we go. So now, you know how there's the RGB craze. Well, this machine was ahead of the time. Now, certainly, it, uh, I don't think it can do every single color under the rainbow, but it can do a, a good selection. So yeah, and you can do that for all of them. LED intensity, turn up and down, which is mainly for the outside ones. So let's, uh, let's look at that. Turn it down, turn them up. So yes, the system is working. But, can we overclock the thing? So hyper-threading is on. Multi-cores are on. Advanced, okay. So, oh, well, let's just go, I can underclock. I can overclock this thing. I was, I was able to get up to four gigahertz, this particular CPU, four gigahertz without any voltage changes. So I'll do that. Um, what, however, performance application support. Okay, so Dell says, no, you can't do it. Yes, unless can you tab down and say yes? Oh, you can. I'm not going to. All right, so there's all sorts of things you can change here. This is fun. Oh, and hard drive acoustic mode. I always say do performance, and if something doesn't work, put to bypass. All right. So with that, I think I will leave you be. We're gonna boot into um, XP Media Center Edition was slapped on this machine just as kind of a tester. And I'm disappointed since after the... Yep, it knows that it says the battery's low and that's fine. No boot device. Well, I'll have to rearrange things. But we know that it's working. Anyway, as I was saying, after the WannaCry virus came out, um, the Windows XP update website seems to have died. I can't connect with any of my XP machines anymore, even ones that are fully up to date. So Windows must have shut that, uh, Microsoft must have shut that down, which is a shame because there are a lot of people who like to slap XP on a machine and get it fully up to date. Windows 2000, you could do the same thing with some tweaks. Um, so that's a, a shame that we've uh, come to that. So. With that, I will leave you be. Stay tuned for part two, where we actually upgrade this thing with um, better graphics cards, graphics cards plural, um, sound card, all sorts of other things. We'll probably play some games on it. So until then, have a great day. I hope you enjoyed this CPU upgrade, and I will talk to you later. <laughs> have a great day, and I'll see you around the channel.